Okay, hey, uh, welcome everybody. How are you guys doing tonight? Wait a minute, how are you guys doing tonight? I'm Steve Dunkel, and uh, I'm just an ordinary guy. And like you, I'm here to uh, learn about some important topics tonight um, from two really fantastic speakers. And uh, get educated on some of the important issues facing our schools and our kids and concerns that we all have as parents and citizens, right? So it's Im this is a really important event. And uh, no fighting over the chairs. When our speakers are up here, I really want you guys to pay close attention and really listen to what they have to say and share. Because um, for the concerns that we have and the reasons that we're here, we're the ones who are going to fix it. We, the people, are going to fix it, right? There's no cavalry that's going to ride over the hill and take care of all of this stuff. So I hope that every one of you are pumped for action. Raise your hand if you're pumped for action. Yeah! Shout it out if you're pumped for action. So I got to warn you, I've never done an MC job. I'm your MC for tonight. Uh, Cynthia Radke asked me if I would do it. I told her the last time I tried something like this, I ended up in prison. So it's really fortunate that just right across the hall, if I get out of hand, it's just a short walk for me to be uh, incarcerated. So we got that base covered. You like that one. Okay, hey, just a few administrative things. We have the restrooms are over here. We have a men's room and we have a women's room and that's the way we're gonna keep it, okay? Also, if you didn't notice when you came in, we've got a silent auction going on in the back here and uh, some really cool stuff, some beautiful wine, beautiful flowers, some golf adventures if there's any golfers in the, in the audience, but I really want you guys to uh, take the time and go check it out and uh, participate in the silent auction. And, and um, the proceeds from that auction are really just to cover the expenses for tonight. But uh, feel, free to, feel free to be generous, dig deep, and be competitive with the silent auction. Don't let somebody ace you out ace you out on those cool uh, cool items back there. The other thing is we got lots of out oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. Diedrich. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey we got snacks tonight if you didn't get dinner or if you're hungry. We got all the basic food groups here and even some non-basic food groups, so be sure to check them all out. And I think, uh, I think that pretty much covers it, so... We good? All right, so I, I'm gonna trust that the sound system's gonna stay stable here, and I wanna introduce our first speaker to you, Mark Melosha. He's currently the executive director for the Family Policy Institute of Washington, focusing on uniting Christians on the issues and matters of life, family, marriage, parental rights, religious freedom, and Christian social justice. If you don't know, Mark served as uh, most recently as a state uh, senator in the Republican Party from 2014 to 2018. And before that, he served seven terms as a Democrat in the state house between the years of 1999 and 2013. So you're probably all well, well aware of Mark. Mark has also served as the chair on the state, or excuse me, the Senate State Government Committee and the House Housing Committee and both the House and Senate Accountability Committees. He's known as a pro-life leader and he's working hard in the efforts to combat homelessness and drug addiction. And I think even more important than that, he's been married 41 years to the lovely Mrs. Michelle Melosha. And if you, that, if you think that's cool, he was also a B-52 pilot, and wait to hear about some of his adventures. So, hey, with no further ado, um, let's give it up for Mark. Come on up, Mark. Thank, thank you very much for that introduction. Technically, I've been married to Michelle for 41 years, two months, and 17 days, but, but we... 
But we all got to count our blessings some way, and that's how I count my blessings. Uh, four hours after I graduated from the Air Force Academy uh, in 1980, Michelle and I ran off to the uh, chapel and got married and then off to the wild blue yonder flying uh, jets for the Air Force. Um, and uh, three kids and ten grandchildren later, uh, we're still going strong, and everything I am today is because of Michelle. So God bless Michelle and, uh, and everything she's done. Okay, Family Policy Institute of Washington. What we do is we're the Christian public policy organization that represents Christians, social conservatives, a people of goodwill of any faith, as long as they work on the issues of life and family and marriage, parental rights, and religious freedom, and now Christian social justice, which encompasses the issues of racism, which we're going to talk about here, and addiction, should we legalize drugs, heroin injection sites, uh, criminal justice, should we fund the police and support law enforcement? So all those issues we have to address as social conservatives or Christians. It is our responsibility to define what type of society we need to live on live under so we have true prosperity a true society based on virtues rather than vices so that's what the family policy institute of washington does i urge you all go online fpiw.org sign up get my news and alerts and then you'll learn about all these issues like i said i've been there since 1998 i won my first election down in olympia so in some ways, I kind of know where all the bodies are buried, um, especially, especially being in the Democratic caucus. I, I can have stories about Governor Gregoire. You guys remember her? That'll make your skin, uh, uh, you know, uh, curdle, you know, so. And, uh, and, and frankly, I was kicked out of that party, and now I serve, uh, I serve as a Republican uh, uh, senator. But now I serve you and all people in this state. So today we're going to talk about critical race theory. For those of you who uh, skip out early, let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Here's some three things you need to know. Critical race theory is fundamentally about indoctrination and power. Number two, you cannot, let me repeat, you cannot have a rational, sane conversation with one of the advocates and leaders on this issue. You cannot. And the third is, your position should be the Reverend Martin Luther King's position. It's about character. It's not about skin color. It is about, your, we are neither slave nor free, rich or poor, you know, free man or, or Gentile or Jew. We are only one in Jesus Christ and the truth that he preached. So, if you just remember that you oppose Christian race theory, you support the Martin Luther King, and you oppose the racist CRT agenda, then that's the Cliff Notes version of what I'm going to say today. Amen. All right. You have to see, you can Google this Loudon teacher resigning back on the East Coast in tears. Did you know how to work it? For some reason. Okay. I, 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 I don't know. Okay, so let's, let's not worry about it then. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, what is critical race theory and where did it come from? Chris, critical race theory is an ide ideology. 
A lot of folks talked about this started with the Frankfurt School from Germany, from radical Marxists leaving Germany. Uh, you can also see, and they landed in Columbia University in the United States, brought this radical Marxist theory. It got into academia, and then it really got put into place by a bunch of academics in the 60s and 70s here in the United States. I can rattle off the names here. Kimberly Crenshaw, Peggy McIntosh, uh, uh, who started this uh, theory of critical race. Look through everything through the lens of race. There are oppressors, uh, oppressors and oppressees. You're only one or the other. And it's a, it's a spin off what used to be called identity politics. Everybody has to decide what they are. And there's a hierarchy of, of, of identities, some more favored than others. And these theories got developed, and it was only a fringe issue uh, uh, until the 90s. And then it broke out in all mainstream academia. This indoctrination uh, joined forces with other movements across the United States. Any of you heard of the radical Howard Zinn? You know, in, uh, again, a Marxist uh, anarchist who kind of rewrote American history and also merged in with what was uh, initially the uh, radical black power movement of the 60s. For those of you old, um, uh, uh, old timers like me, I can still remember uh, the Black Panthers. They uh, about radical black power and violence to get their way. It's all about the fundamental principles of segregation of race. Uh, so this movement took off in academia uh, in about uh, in the 90s and then ended up reaching mainstream after uh, in the uh, 2000s, the early 2000s. And it started going off into, uh, again, still fringe groups, but it was out there. It didn't hit the mainstream in the United States till about six years ago in politics. I left the Democratic Party in 20. 13. At that point, critical race theory wasn't even discussed at all. There's no such issue about systematic racism. For that's remember one of the uh, one of the uh, rules from the other side is that that we live in a society that is structurally or systematic racist. Unfortunately, we have a thing called the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. For those of you who may remember that. And then, then literally the, uh, the, the good deeds from the Reverend Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s uh, eliminated systematic racism in the United States. It held on in a little places, sometimes in the South and sometimes in a few organizations. But as far as government, at the state and local level, it was eliminated. Now, of course, sometimes government is corrupt and, and it is racist. But for the most part, systematic racism disappeared in the 90s. In fact, if you were to look at the def definition of systematic racism, a fear or a hatred or a, a, a great discrimination against people of a particular pigmentation or color, today the only systematic racist activity is happening against Asians and whites in our country. That's it. Quotas, um, efforts to uh, give preferences for college admissions, which disproportionately hit, hit the Asian American community in the United States. Uh, that is systematic racism. But systematic racism against IPOC or people of color has for the most part the United States literally disappeared. Uh, I can mention some of the names and you can see them up here who made the mainstream here the last just the last four years. Uh, uh, Ibram Kendi published Stamp from the Beginning and then, of course, there's Robin D'Angelo, who did her famous book. And, uh, and, of course, everything sort of exploded when George Floyd w tragically died uh, last year. And for those of you who studied that issue, we had all those riots, but not one charge was made about that being a racist event or a racist killing. Understand that we had all those riots against racism by BLM and Antifa but not one person made a public charge of racism against that law enforcement officer. But that's what we got out of that. So this movement right now is unfortunately uh, deceiving the public about really trying to uh, fix the ills 
of the black community. Okay, another slide. This is uh, Ben Shapiro. What Ben Shapiro does here, he gets into a little debate with somebody on the other side, talks all about systematic racism and everything else, and the gentleman actually agrees with him. This is about oppressors and oppressees. This is about white privilege, you know, and, and whites need to apologize. And the, and the person he's debating from the left actually agreed with him. So uh, that is something about some of the, the folks that are on the other side. They're actually sincere. Many of them are sincere at that, that, uh, of what is happening, that there is real racist activity going on in the United States and government. But when you ask them to show the proof, there is no proof. There is inequities. There is some statistical dis imbalance going on in the United States. For example, uh, it is uh, blacks as a community make less money than other races. They are thrown in jail more. Uh, and the reason is, is because unfortunately that community is, uh, is burdened by an excess of violence and illegal activity. Uh, uh, dropout rates for black Americans, unfortunately, are the worst in the nation. These are real problems, but the answer isn't racism, it's about fixing what is wrong with certain parts of the black community. So systematic racism doesn't exist, and we have to be honest about, let's fix the problem, but don't look like, look for the scapegoats, uh, that it is uh, uh, US and slavery which is affecting the black community today. All right, okay. So why is, why is a critical race theory being promoted today? Frankly, it's for the reason I mentioned. Uh, everybody knew 10 years ago in the Democratic Party and, and even in mainstream media that uh, blacks were being uh, uh, disproportionately put into jail. And we all knew the reasons was. Uh, there were inner cities and all these programs being put in place on homelessness, on reducing uh, violence in the black community, were all complete failures. Our human service system, our homeless system, our drug system had failed to do the right thing for, po for people in poverty, which is overwhelming black Americans. But the biggest reason, and nobody talks about this, is that the black community, and we all have known this since the Monaghan Report, is the black community, unfortunately, 70% of children raised are raised in a single parent household. That's the key to almost anything. Do you know 90% of the folks in prison were raised in a single parent household? If we solve that problem, we solve that problem, we take care of the inequities and the issues with the black community. So what all the politicians and the ideologues needed a scapegoat, so let's blame history. Let's blame America, but that's not the problem. Frankly, a huge amount of social programs have been built to try to help folks in the inner city in the black community, and unfortunately, they have all failed. Um, and today, the second point is, uh, unfortunately, with those on the left, there used to be balance there. I was one of the moderate conservative Democrats, Senator Jim Hargrove, anybody know him? Uh, there you go, uh, Tim Sheldon, uh, anybody know him? There were a lot of moderate and conservative Democrats who put balance on the radical theories. They're all gone. So unfortunately, what has happened with the Democratic Party, mainstream media, academia, they're literally so narrow in ideology and all their programs have completely and utterly failed that frankly, they need a scapegoat. And unfortunately, the scapegoat is everybody in this room, is the government is the U.S. history, is the Constitution. Uh, we had real troubles with racism and bigotry in our country 50 years ago, but right now, we don't today. And, uh, and, and right now, uh, unfortunately, that is, if you look at the other root cause in our society, uh, we've moved away from our Judeo-Christian heritage. That was, the, the values of our country was formed by Christian leaders, uh, in, uh, in 1776, and we've, uh, we've eliminated that worldview, that moral code, that way of looking at problems. Critical race theory brings in a new wor worldview. Again, it is hostile to American Judeo-Christian heritage, hostile to Western civilization, hostile to all the principles that just made this country great the last 250 years. Unfortunately, 
this is what's taking up in America. We've replaced Christianity with this kind of neo-pagan neo radical uh, ideology. Um, so now I'll give you, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to go through a series of slides here. Uh, everybody here has Google and Internet right now. If you just Google critical race theory in the schools, you're going to get a thousand examples of what's being done and what this indoctrination program looks like in the schools. It is everywhere, uh, literally. And, and it makes you almost throw, throw up or cry like you saw from that teacher who literally quit on their job um, in, uh, in her school district. She absolutely refused, refused to teach that in her schools. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately in Washington State, we still have a lot of school boards who are sort, sort of sane. Uh, I am assuming out here your school board is more sane than what we see in Seattle or in my school district in Federal Way or in King County. But, but school boards still can make a difference on this issue and prevent this. A failing of the bill that they passed, the, uh, the critical race theory bill that they passed last year, it's still under the control of the school board. Not OSPI, the Superintendent of Public uh, uh, Instruction. Chris Reichdahl cannot mandate this right now. You can still pick the criteria. After all, everybody likes diversity, inclusion, you know, equity, depending on how you define it. We can live with that. Un uh, so you can still control that. Unfortunately, knowing how these folks operate, there will be a bill within four years to centralize and mandate control from OSPI. That is exactly what they did with the sex ed bill. Now they're working on a faster timetable. Um, they will move relatively soon to mandate and mandate a certain curriculum, a certain indoctrination program. So my takeaway for, for you on this point is they're not going away. You could win here locally, you can elect the, the uh, right school board members, but until we take control of the state, and they own the state right now, they passed nine critical race theories uh, last year. Medical training, colleges, on and on. Uh, but right now, the program is not defined. You can define it so it's not harmful. And uh, right here, you know, it, it, some of the rhetoric right now is, is absolutely ridiculous. You know, they talk about abolition of prisons, uh, of police departments, uh, intersectionality, and again, how some, based on your pigmentation, some groups are more favorable than others. And um, here it is again. Uh, everyone has a racial identity. Uh, 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 race is a defining social, tr social construct in American life. So what they believe is race defines everything. Uh, whether you're right or wrong, or virtuous, or good or evil, it's all defined by pigmentation. It is a crazy I ideology, but, it is, but people are blindly following this right now. Um, here's from the Bainbridge uh, uh, School District, their DEI plan. Again, this all depends on what type of uh, school board they have. Uh, they use an equity framework, uh, curriculum materials, they must represent a diverse community, but it includes anti-racism training uh, throughout K-12, and that's a key, anti-racism training. We know from those folks like Kendi and Robin D'Angelo, if you're not fighting racism according to their standards, you know, if you're not being an anti-racist, then you're a racist. If you don't agree with white privilege, you're a racist. If you don't agree with implementing this program, you're a racist. See, it's so funny. You just disagree with me and you're a racist. I wish it was that easy. But they've literally redefined what it means to be racist. And they, they set up these words like white privilege, which means uh, and uh, white fragility, which means, oh, you disagree with um, uh, critical race theory, so that means you're fragile and you're actually uh, truly an unconscious racist. So that's the ideology. And, and you can't argue or, or debate or reason with somebody with that side, that sort of ideology. Uh, here's another, another couple slides from the Tumwater School District. Again, all this stuff is online. It's really crazy that kids are learning all this thing in the K-12 system. Uh, showing the privilege pie. 
And again, just the usual things. If you're, you're cisgender, which means you have normal sexuality, uh, Christian, heterosexual, you know, uh, you know, you're, you're privileged. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you're unfortunately in the wrong group. Um, and the pyramid of white supremacy, I mean, some of the stuff is, is, uh, is literally unreal. There are two sides to every story. That makes you a racist, you know, that you're, you're working for the wrong side. Um, in fact, I put a list down here of all the things I literally was listening to a couple of programs from a couple of people talking about critical race theory on my way up here. And, um, and it's amazing, all tests are racist right now, especially standardized tests. Roads are racist. Uh, all the, the big uh, highway system and, 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 and moving people into suburbs are all racist. So those roads were designed for racist purposes. Enforcing laws is racist. Math is racist. Uh, 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 tests, all tests are racist. Uh, showing um, uh, uh, your ID for voting is racist. Though, as you all realizing with the vaccines, that's the one thing that's not racist, demanding vaccines from folks. Uh, it, it, it goes on and on. Uh, unfortunately, you can't reason with folks like this. Uh, when you start saying any test is racist, so let's close down tests. AP, uh, where I grew up in New York City, they're getting rid of all the AP, the advanced classes. Unfortunately, black Americans are doing, doing badly in those classes, so the answer is get rid of them. No more advanced classes than New York public school system. Unreal. This dumbing everybody down to the lowest denominator. What will that do to children or to a functioning society if, if everybody got to be as dumb or the curriculum got to be as dumbed down as, as, as the least capable student in the school district? It is unreal. No tests. Well, everybody's equal. Everybody's going to go to, they have the, and I went to one of them, Bronx School of Science, these specialized uh, uh, science and math schools, advanced schools, and no, 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 no more tests to get in there because that's racist, so we're going to let everybody go in. So again, no no sort of advance or, or, uh, or, or advanced learning is allowed at all for students. What would that do for a country like that? It's unreal. This pure ideology. Oops. Uh, oh, here, here's a, again, talk about how they're not ra uh, rational. Unfortunately, uh, Asians uh, students were, were uh, doing too well on test scores. And bumping up the numbers for the IPOC, all people of color, so they unilaterally made a decision that they're not students of color. You know, they took them out of the group. And in fact, that's the biggest evidence, the biggest fact that should support any evidence that there is no systematic racism against people of color. Asians, they have a culture of studious, the tiger mom, of work, work, work. Uh, and, unfo and unfortunately for the other side, they're doing very well in school. They're searching the advanced classes. They're working hard, doing the homework, not taking drugs. And it works. Let's see. Oops. Uh, again, here this talks about white fragility training. Uh, uh, again, Robin D'Angelo did a whole book about this. White people are instructed not to defend themselves from accusations of racism. You're automatically guilty. Don't defend yourself. Uh, they're literally asking every white person in America to shut up, literally, and take the abuse. This is racist. Uh, and again, uh, one other thing about the critical race theory, the way the law reaches, they had a little thing is diversity, uh, 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 equity, and inclusion it also includes uh, the SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity issues. So they're put into a matrix. So this is not just about race. This is about sexual orienta orientation and gender identity. And guess which groups are higher privileged than heterosexuals? Those groups. So again, it's the same issues on that. It's a merging of these movements going on. So those classes also will be getting into the issues of gender and sexuality and be taught to your children. Um, and um, again, uh, it, it's not rational. And of course, there are more and more uh, uh, items popping up on the internet about literally segregating folks by color for training. There was something that, uh, that, uh, that just made the uh, news uh, uh, this week. But literally, they're, they're forcing whites and blacks to go into uh, separate uh, uh, classrooms to get taught. Um, there was a, there's a, a great video online of a, of a black mother screaming at this person, says, I don't want my kids to go 
be with just blacks. I want them to be integrated in class. This is bringing back racism. And, and she's literally arguing with the superintendent who happened to be another black woman saying, no, no, it's okay. She goes, this is what happened 40 years ago. You're going back to what happened 40 years ago. But that's, uh, that's how these folks think right now. They don't quite understand that this is going back to the bad old days. And then of course the 1619 project was that uh, piece of propaganda put out by the New York Times. And it's also put into the school curriculum all across the nation. Basically a rewrite of history. Uh, a lot of the stuff that Howard Zinn was put into that. But literally uh, rewrote uh, uh, American history and put the blame squarely on the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution and our, uh, and our founders of our nation. Uh, uh, it was brutally criticized by, in, in fact, many uh, 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 academics, both liberal, conservative, and moderate. But unfortunately, this ideology is, ideology is still being put forward. Uh, I just threw up a bunch of names of folks here in the states that made no, I should have, where's Sharon? I apologize, Sharon, I should have put your name up here also. Chris Rufo, anybody here ever hear of Chris Rufo from Gig Harbor? He ran for Seattle City Council. He's a conservative, works for the Man Manhattan Institute. He works for the, oh no, uh, the Manhattan Journal? No, City Journal. He worked for the Manhattan Institute and he worked for the Discovery Institute in Seattle. Some of you may have heard of those policy institutes. Uh, he is probably one of the leading voices in our nation about opposing critical race theory. He's the one that got President Trump to, to put out that executive order banning critical race theory in schools. So if you want to learn, I read him every day. If you want to be on top of the issues, he's a go-to person in our nation about critical race theory. So please go see Chris Ru Rufo, one of our own who made it big. Uh, Jason Rance, uh, a radio announcer in Seattle. Uh, Bishop Thomas Daly. Bishop Thomas Daly, again, uh, we need leaders like this in, in America. His own head of Catholic Charities came up and said the Catholic Church is racist. The Catholic Charities is a racist organization. We need to listen to BLM. The bishop publicly went out and says, we're not racist. BLM is a Marxist organization. They're trying to destroy the nuclear family. We have nothing to do with them. And so that's what we need. People speaking up, honestly, uh, and, and setting the record straight. Uh, and, and it was good to see at least one person on the other side back down and apologize for that. And um, uh, the Washington Policy Center, uh, some of you may know them. Uh, they are also uh, our, our largest policy organization, conservative in our state. Great work, again, on, with Live Fine against critical race theory. Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. They're a national bipartisan group. So there's still a number of liberals and moderates on the other side who understand that uh, critical race theory will destroy our nation. So they're not completely woke, the left is. There are folks out there who get it, that this will destroy America. Uh, Glenn Lowry, he's a, a black economist uh, from Brown University, one of the, uh, in fact, he was the podcast I was listening to uh, coming here. Uh, Douglas Murray, he happens to be a, a a gay author, a gay uh, political commentator from England, but he did this book, The Madness of the Crowds. He specifically went against critical race theory. And it's unreal to see folks, even across over in England, get, get the idea that critical race theory is racist. Uh, and then guess what? 21 US states have banned it, banned it uh, in America in the last two years. 21 st states. We need to ban it in our state, and we need to do something about the legislature to do that. <laughs> Ultimately, that is the only way we're going to stop it. The only way. The other side has infiltrated the school district, teachers union, is that a surprise to anybody? Um, and, uh, and they will push this. It is happening everywhere. And now they got, the, uh, with the passage of 5044, they're going to get the money to implement it. Uh, but it's still, the local school boards can still shut it down. Uh, let's see. And, and just a little bit about the bill. I, I think I covered most of the issues right now. Um, they really haven't defined all these uh, terms yet. Diversity, equity. If Mark, Mo if Mark Melosha was in, in charge of a school district, I, you could make it work. It'd be, it'd, be, uh, it'd be fully moral and appropriate. But unfortunately, the folks in control have a worldview, a morality that is really hostile to Christianity. 
and frankly to any, any person of any sense of any religion. Uh, what, we, what can we do individually? This is the standard stuff. Uh, I've been to Mason County about five times. You get politics and you know how to work your community. Uh, go to your school board meetings. Uh, demand to see what they're passing out. You have to see. With COVID, that's how come Chris Rufo got a lot of evidence. Everything was online. Um, but you have to demand to see it. You'll get a lot of resistance from folks nowadays. Now they're going back. They'll be hiding materials. But d demand to see that. Remember, insist on teaching equality and virtue as defined by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. You can't go wrong, you know, saying that you support his solutions to racism. Uh, uh, content of character, not color of skin. Uh, school choice vouchers. Frankly, this is, I've been working in education poly probably as long as Sharon over there, Sharon Hannix replaced me. The, uh, the only way we're going to fix our school system is have competition. We need vouchers. We need choice. We need to make, give parents the ability to choose for homeschooling or private school when they desire. The, the, it, is, it, is, it is a monopoly that is actually harming kids right now our public schools. It really is. Uh, and, um, and again, uh, and I say this everywhere, vote for people who oppose this. Make them take a position. Make the elected officials take a position on this issue. Will you speak up against this and will you vote against this? Uh, and, um, and again, what I said before, don't get into arguments or debates. You know, um, you, don't, you don't get in arguments with insane people or, you know, three-year-olds. Don't get it into a debate with one of these activists on critical race theory. It's a lose-lose. You know, you know, you support Reverend Martin Luther King. You're against racism. All races need to be treated equally. Period. If you believe otherwise, you're a racist. You're bigoted. It's pretty simple argument. If not critical race theory, what to do about black inequity? See, and that's the key. Uh, racism is a hatred or fear or loathing or harm done to a person based on their skin color or their race. Inequity means some statistic is off. For example, the NBA is 90% black. They're 11% of the population. Is the NBA a racist definition? If you, if you apply the definition of inequity, you would say they are. But it's not racist. Everybody knows that. And I guess everybody knows why blacks are flunking out of schools or, or why blacks keep, uh, have 50% of the murders in the United States. It's because of culture, faith, how they deal with drugs and virtue, personal choices. There's so many government programs out there that can help almost anybody out there. So if you want to get helped, if you want, you want to prosper, you can. You just got to make the right cho choices on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You really have to make the right life choices and get married. You know, Michelle has rescued me at least three times in my life from stupid stuff. But anyway, uh, so what are the solutions? On my website, on the back, I put how do you address inequity, a policy agenda to in, in, address inequity in the black community. And frankly, as Christians, as true leaders, we should be concerned that black community is failing in the public schools, in the job market, with crime, in the courts, hooked on drugs. That is our responsibility to propose a solution. Unfortunately, we are not proposing a solution. So I have a 10-point plan. It's basically my legislative agenda that I fought for. Again, focus on marriage and virtue and faith. You know, school choice. Uh, you promote work and personal responsibility. You know, uh, uh, avoid sex outside marriage. Don't get pregnant before married. It's common sense things we don't teach our children, and we don't teach our neighbors anymore. And do something about, about all the vices that are going rampant right now. It's pretty simple. We need to pass that. Now the excuse in our state is the wrong people are in charge right now in the state. They don't like any of that stuff. And they need to come up with, a, uh, like I said, they need to come up with a scapegoat for why the billions they put toward addressing this issue have completely and utterly failed. Their answer is legalize drugs, le legalize vice, legalize crime, get rid of tests, dumb down the schools. None of that's going to work. 
And we're seeing the effects of that. Anybody ever travel through Seattle now? Oh, it's a horrible place right now. It, it's like one of those dystopian movies you see. They're very rich in their skyscrapers, making a zillion bucks. And then folks destitute just shooting up and dying on the streets. It is really a horrible situation. But we need to take a responsibility for our community and come up with a policy solution. It's not just say no to the Democrats' plan or the liberals' plan or those folks pushing this. We have, to, we have to rally behind an agenda that actually will break the cycle of violence and poverty that we know existed and we know what the root causes are ever since, again, Senator uh, or Daniel Patrick Monaghan did his Monaghan report in the 60s. It comes back to family and faith. That's it. Questions? I've talked a lot about this. Uh, uh, does anybody have any thoughts about what to do? Any disagreements about what I said? Or it's pretty simple. Martin Luther King is the answer. Virtue and faith is the answer. Hey, I, for the question and answer session, if you're comfortable, we'd like you to step up to the mic. If I can do it, you guys can certainly do it right. So step right up and uh, fire away. I would just like to know what you know about voucher systems in other states and what's going on across the country? Uh, good question. They are exploding in the red states. Um, West Virginia, about a month ago, was the last state that just passed it. Uh, what is going on right now, uh, and we were uh, supporting this, there was a decision, Montana versus Espinoza, last year, Supreme Court made a decision that uh, there was a ban against tax credits for private Christian schools. It was overturned. There's another decision coming up. We think it'll overturn what's called the Blaine Amendment. So the answer to your question is one is we need vouchers and parents need to pick the schools that'll teach the right values for their kids. The teachers union, the folks in control of the education establishment, and I'll be blunt, they're corrupt. They don't care about parents. In fact, they're trying to take away uh, uh, your rights as parents to raise your child as the way you see fit. They're trying to emancipate children sexually, literally. Um, a, uh, Planned Parenthood clinics are now being set up in the schools. Uh, on and on and on. So you need an alternative. So we're seeing a revolution in the other states. We need to have it, and there's a group of us are trying to figure a way, can we do this by initiative? So uh, we're not going to get it through, the, uh, through the, um, the legislature. In fact, I was in the legislature when the Democratic Party, this was 2003, supported charter schools. Some of you may remember uh, Kathy Haig, uh, she was one of the leaders on that and whatnot. So the Democrats passed charter schools, the teachers fought it, and, and, the, and the teachers union got all upset. So they literally withheld their, all their money from every Democratic legislative candidate in the state. Basically said to them, you switch your, 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 uh, uh, your position on our tutor schools or you're not going to get a dime for us. So guess what? 80% of the Democrat legislators switched their position on charter schools. They own them now. The, the teachers union owns the Democratic Party. That's what happened. So we can't expect the Democrats to do the right thing now. Uh, 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 I'm not sure when the Republicans will have control of the governorship in the two chambers, but the initiative is a process. And that'll... That'll solve half the problems if we have choice in that competition. Uh, Mark, what, um, <clears throat> what are the limitations and what are the abilities of school boards uh, when it comes to things that have been passed by the legislature as far as implementing, um, you know, there's the sex ed curriculum and there's this, this um, uh, you know, the BLM stuff, all that, all that uh, that's going through. What are the limitations and what are the abilities of the school boards? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the second sex ed bill, I was around for the first ed, sex ed bill, but the second sex ed bill gave OSPI, uh, the superintendent of public instruction, uh, power to punish or hold accountable school districts on sex ed. So unless you are real, really creative um, about nullification or the teacher in the classroom about not doing what they said, uh, right now Chris Reichdahl has made comments that he will make sure this is enforced or you lose money. Uh, uh, and, and frankly, that's what the legislature is doing in our state. They're centralizing power um, at the state level and a lot of different institutions and, and programs 
and, uh, and departments and government. And uh, they, they realize they can control all of government. Uh, they can't control the independent school districts or the independent cities. So uh, this fight between centralization and decentralization, there's always a balance in that. But right now, since they had decades of control, they're centralizing on every issue that they favor um, at the state level. So, uh, so that's, that's a problem being in a one party state like California and here. Um, uh, they, start, uh, they start implementing all these hard programs. And frankly, all they need is the voters in King County and they get what they want. It, it, uh, so we're gonna look like King County uh, I mean, on all the issues, growth management, guns, I had a list of all, all, all the issues you can't talk rationally with the other side. You know, I'm up to 18 issues. Vaccines, the latest issue, and uh, you can't talk rationally. Homelessness, immigration, uh, school vouchers, uh, uh, accountability, climate change. Uh, and they're centralizing all the powers, taking powers for not just from the school districts, from all local governments also. Uh, how do we vote them out if we're voting by mail? Uh, uh, that is a good question. Um, uh, I believe, honestly, they're not still not paying attention at the local races. Uh, I think they really only care about uh, the big races at the top. But the day is coming um, when they're going to be taking over all the, the local school districts. What they did in Federal Way, Federal Way had a conservative school board, consider uh, a, cons a conservative uh, uh, mayor, conservative uh, city council just eight years ago. The whole crowd of Seattle just came down and took over, threw their money, threw their weight in, and just scared everybody. And now it's, compl I mean, they're more liberal than the people in Seattle, it seems like, the, the school board members we have in Federal Way. So, uh, so that's their, what I'm seeing they're doing. Um, so I, I don't think we're going to have to worry about the election integrity at the local levels yet, but we have to get control of that. There's a lot of loopholes, especially with the uh, ID portion that we need to get, get fixed. Okay. I'd like to know what this community is going to do to eradicate the critical race theory and all this other nonsense that's going on. Um, you say the school district has its own power. I want to know how this community is going to mobilize, come together and get it done. So if you have advice on how to do that for everyone in here, I mean, we can talk all we want, but it's time for action. So let's get our asses in gear and make it happen. Yes, sir. you hold your candidates accountable. Force them, like I said earlier, force them to say out loud where they stand on a position. As, as a former elected elect official, I can tell you, uh, politicians know 50 ways not to answer a question. Um, uh, what we're doing, uh, oh, I, I didn't bring with me, but, uh, what we're, we started doing it this year, we have a questionnaire where we uh, interview all candidates and we make them put in writing where they stand. So we haven't come to this district yet, but we will be here. We have a scorecard and we uh, endorse all people at the legislative level. Look at our scorecard that we did uh, for this area. Representative Jim Walsh got 100%, so I wanted to thank him, uh, put a shout out for him. And I'll just say another shout out. Oh, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Walsh is for a lifetime record with our organization. He's only had one bad vote. So he's one of our champions. He's a real good guy. In fact, we're starting a Christian caucus in the state GOP and in the regional areas. So we're going to set up a regional FPIW here to hold your locally elected accountable. And we need folks in the room to be part of that effort. We're trying to organize the churches to be part of this. So it's hard to, you know, to mobilize and hold people accountable from the main office in Linwood, but if local folks, a small group of local folks can hold everybody accountable, and you make them fill out those questionnaires, make them fill it out, and, um, and you do that, you'll get the people voting and doing the right thing in office. I was wondering, um, would it be possible to, to have our representatives for example, you would be in a good example, um, putting out something where we could um, have an election of how to change how we elect people. For example, I was thinking the Electoral College allows for rural states to get votes, but where those of us who live in rural, rural counties are not listened to and we have to pay taxes. The Boston Tea Party was 
was based on taxation without representation. Uh, you bring up a good point. I've heard a lot of suggestions about how to reform the, the election process. Uh, 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 other than doing a constitutional convention, which is extremely hard, the best way to fix the, the uh, election system is by making sure you have election integrity at the local level uh, and you have a small group that holds the folks accountable before they get in office. Uh, uh, you get this person to say that they will do X, Y, Z uh, 900 ti 999 times out of 1,000, they will stick with you. So you have to get to the politicians before they get into office and make them commit. And when they do something, uh, a bad vote, you hold them accountable. I mean, that's how democracy works. And so you have to do that. Um, but again, I, uh, I remember uh, President John Adams, you know, our Constitution was only made for a moral or religious people. It doesn't matter how good a Constitution or government system you have. You have immoral or insane people in office, uh, uh, you get that. And so uh, it, it's all about, you know, uh, finding out how they are morally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, sanity-wise on the issues and you hold them accountable. That's the system we have in place, and, um, and, we, uh, and, and dickering or changing with the system in the long run uh, 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 it doesn't work. It's all about good citizens speaking up and holding their uh, officials accountable. Assume there's enough good citizens in, the, in your community. In my community in, in King County in Seattle, uh, I think the whole place has gone insane. You know, the inmates have taken over the asylum. Uh, 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 there's not very many moral religious folks, in my judgment, living in uh, King County. Uh, that's one person's opinion. Uh, I, I know it's different out here. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I have a comment and a question. I know it's so important to have a two-parent family. I support that. I grew up like that. It's very, very strong when you have a two-parent family. If the women who are single parents, the moms, I want to give a shout out to them too, because they are very many of them out there that are wonderful mothers and leaders, and their children grow up great. So I petition the men out there to come and help those women to continue to be good leaders as a male. Even tomorrow there's a march here in Shelton for life and I am seeing more and more men show up and I think that's great. But we need these men to come and help us women. I've been a single mom, two of my daughters are single moms and they are great moms. Thank you. The second is a question about the military. A lot of this um, racism seems to have been missing from the military, the most esteemed group in our country. And now I'm afraid that they're being attacked and infiltrated by CRT just the way schools and communities are. So what can we do to learn more and to help these military who are under you know, under what, directives that they sometimes can't help, orders, how can we help them and be more aware of that? That's a very and good- thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome, ma'am, thank you. Uh, that's a, a very good question. The, uh, the military, there's been a lot of evidence in the last six months under the Biden administration, they've come sort of woke in nature and, um, and, and pushing this ideology. I think they're going to have a lot of resistance from folks uh, down in the ranks on that. Uh, uh, the one thing about being in the military, when, and, and I was very fortunate flying my airplanes, I ne was never in combat, but you do, have a, you, you do have a bond, a band of brothers, so to speak, or a band of brothers and sisters, so to speak, with the other folks that you serve with. And uh, that transcends skin color or class or anything else. 
because of your patriotism or your ideology of serving your country and that constitution, willing to die for an idea or your neighbors. So I think that, that ideology will ultimately fail in the military. I'm actually hopeful because I know the ranks, they already have an idea, ideology of sacrifice, of service, of standards. In the military, you can't play these games with race and, and ability and standards. People die if you screw up. You can play these games in a government bureaucracy where performance and, and, and saving lives isn't very critical, but in the military, you can't play those games. So I don't think, I think the one place where, uh, unless, unless the entire military gets completely corrupted, I, I think they're, go, uh, they're going to find a hard time changing that. Same thing with the police officers and law enforcement. I have two things to say. First of all, that lady just reminded me of a friend of mine that's a police officer being defunded. They're doing CRT. He's quitting, and a lot of them are. It's, it's crazy. And then the next thing is I got an email the other day from some, I'm not sure what it was from, but it's for Washington State for the um, sexual education of children. Mm -hmm. And one part that stuck in my head that just, I couldn't believe it. They said sex was okay for kids 12 and above, and it's okay not to do uh, condoms, pills, and stuff like that, as long as you pull out of the vagina or the anus before you ejaculate. This is the kind of stuff they're gonna teach our children. It's crazy. I just had to Well, say uh, you're right. I mean, we all know if you watch Netflix or Hulu or what's going on in Hollywood, uh, movie Cuties, I talked about that in one of my blogs, uh, there is a movement to um, lower the age of, 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 of consent for children down to 13. Um, uh, uh, what was called pedophilia will be legal in this nation. It will be an effort within 10 years. You see it happening. Um, uh, so uh, that's the future. That's this ideology and worldview. It is an anti-Christian ideology, but it's going back to how the world operated before Christians took over uh, 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 Europe uh, back in 300 AD. Yes, sir. Well, my name is uh, Michael Curtin. Um, there are several people running for uh, the Shelton School Board that I know that are conservative, but, and then also I'm running for North Mason School Board, and I'm against critical race theory, against the sex ed stuff, against uh, all the rest of this garbage, the um, bathrooms and the women on, on our boys, on women's you know sports teams, and all that. So hold, find out who's running, what they believe in, and then hold us accountable. If Michael Curtin. So those, you have to know, but hold, you know, I expect, you know, if I win, hold me accountable. You know, that's the way we're, also I'm against uh, forcing people to wear a mask, and I'm against forcing people to be vaccinated. This is a free country. I spent 20 years in the military. So I fought for freedom not to watch it be slipped away or be part of taking it away from people. I think you just answered half our questions. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity that we have tonight to be sitting in here and after the last year and a half, and actually in my life, after the last 40 years in being in ed education, um, to see some continuation of questions and possible procedures by which we can go by to help the children of the future, maybe not even our great-grandchildren at this point. But what set me off to stand up here tonight is something that I think is pretty important. And um, we're sitting in the, in the Civic Center, and we're sitting in a room, we're talking about our government, and we have no American flag, and we have no Washington State flag. And I think that when we get together as a group, if we're gonna be part of the United States, and part of Washington State, that we should have both of those present because it shows the honor that we have for our country, our state, and our military, and the procedure at which 
this country was developed. And I thank you for my chance to speak this evening. Thank you, sir. I don't have a question, but uh, Mark, I want to personally thank you. You and I have crossed paths probably half a dozen times now over the last six months or so. So I know how hard you are working for these issues and how important this is to you. And I want everybody else to know that about Mark as well. This guy is putting his heart and soul into addressing these issues. So I want you guys to give it up for, give it up for Mark. It, it's an honor to share the same airspace as you. Thank you. Please call me. Uh, get my cards over there. I'm uh, happy to chat with anybody. Uh, this is like the fourth time I've been back to Mason County. You guys are wonderful. But uh, any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. So please uh, sign up FDIW.org and learn about all the issues. Thank you. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you. Hey, listen, team. Um, it's break time. But you know what? There's a couple of things. In your break time, I wor really want you to hit the silent auction table and unleash unleash your competitive instincts <laughs> unleash and then while you're at it if you're taking a break and you want more information and want to sign up we'd love to get your your contact information this board will be uh, back there for you to sign up and then when you're all done exhausting yourselves through competitive uh, auction tactics be sure to uh, clean up the rest of the snacks over there okay and uh, we'll regroup right at uh, 715 I think You wanted me to make sure that you guys understood that it wasn't the policy of the Civic Center or our city government to hide these flags. They just had them stored around the corner and we forgot to bring them out. So they're here. Okay, you guys ready for our next speaker? Who's excited for our next speaker? Yeah. If you don't know Sharon Hannock already, you will. She's been described by many as a watchdog mom, but I, th I think of her more as the family-friendly version of the honey badger. So when she's, not, when she's not out there saving the world, Sharon is an accountant, a community volunteer, a wife, and a mom who became active in the political arena when she became involved in education issues. Her mother bear instincts, or honey badger, family friendly honey badger instincts, uh, brought her into the political arena where she became known as research mom. In 2012, Sharon made headlines by being the first candidate to win a statewide write-in campaign in her primary bid for the uh, office of state treasurer. Although she didn't win in the general election, she gave it a good run though. Even though she didn't win in the general election, she went on to win her next race and become the chair of the Pierce County Charter Review Commission. Sharon has been active and is still very active in our community and the Republican Party, and she's past president of the East Pierce Republican Women's Club and currently serves as first vice chair of the Washington Federation of Republican Women. In 2018, Sharon was awarded the Andy Hill Award for Service at the Roanoke Conference, and she's been appointed to positions on the Pierce County Planning Commission and the Pierce County Birth 25 Commission. I want to hear more about that. Over the years, Sharon's been a, a guest on local radio and national radio programs, and, and she continues to give presentations on activism, education, and the global agenda. Sharon believes that citizens are getting involved, or that citizens getting involved like all of us here tonight can change our state and will change our state and is committed to helping others learn to be a strong voice in their community and in politics. So let's give it up for Sharon. Gonna, I'm not gonna stand behind the podium. I 
don't like that. I can't see you either when you can't see me. So um, I'm going to start by telling, my name is Sharon Hannock. I'm also known as Research Mom. Because when I started finding out what was going on in education, you know, you, as a parent, you have kids and you think, do I put my kids in private school or public school or home school? Those were the decisions pre-COVID. And um, then what, what I did was start looking around what's going on and finding out what was going on. And then realizing a lot of it comes from laws of Washington State. Just the reason why we have the system we have now is because of laws. And I'll be going over that a little bit more. And then I started going to Olympia because I live in the Tacoma area. It, it's a 45 minute drive there. And I used to go to our CR legislators and say, hey, that law you're going to put into place, did you know that you wrote into that law a book called We the People? Well, then I bought We the People. And I said, oh my goodness, you can't put this book into law. And by the way, some of you may recognize this as your textbook. But I said, you can't do that. And I started showing them pages from here as to why they shouldn't do it. Of course, they passed the law anyway, um, largely supported by the Republican, because, gee, we do want to teach the Constitution, don't we? That's what everybody wants. But maybe by the end of today, you'll be a little bit more cautious about what you're going to put, you know, how you phrase your words. But then this one legislator used to say, here comes that mom with all that research. And I thought, okay, so they know me as the mom with research and it developed into research mom. So then that was back in 2003 and 2004. Over the years, as I started joining with other moms and dads and in 2000, about three years ago, there was a law called the Home Visitation Law, the Universal Home Visitation Law, where they want to get into the home of every newborn child, and maybe every child that you take care of. Maybe you're a grandmother, you're a parent. And so I joined with some other um, moms in my area, and we stopped it. Of course, we didn't stop it just us. We, just, we stopped it because we got word out through social media, emails and things, and actually you stopped it, those of you who made those phone calls. And at that time, we thought, oh, you know, we need to pull together and become a force, and that's when my family, my choice, was born. My family, my choice is a political action committee, um, and therefore we do a lot of um, Citizen activists, I don't want to use the word lobbying. There's no one here that works for PDC, is there? Um, but so just make sure we're not lobbyists. We're citizen activists that go down and voice our, our concerns. And heading, so then that was born. And then last year, we do a lot of legislative training so that, and you'll be seen coming up again in January if you want to sign up. We teach people how to be very proactive against the, the bills, how to write testimony, how to be effective in Olympia, even if you don't go into Olympia, but from your own home. There are things that you can do. So just get that. My Family, My Choice, um, that website. We also have been involved in training, um, giving training sessions for school board candidates. I know there are some in here. Um, we talk about school board governance what you're going to get into when you get there. We're talking about laws. We're talking about how to talk about issues as a candidate. And so there's a lot of programs that we do offer when we, with the My Family, My Choice. And then I also dabble a little bit into voter integrity. So if you want to get involved in voter integrity, see Steve, wherever he is, if you're in this area. He's taking care of that for us. But I'm going to start then by um, you know, we he hear the word and what Mark was saying is we're dumbing down. I want to bring to you a new concept. We're not dumbing down. We're rewiring the brain on how you make decisions and how you think. And the battlefield is in the mind. To start with, I want you to kind of think back and think, what is education? Why do we send our kids to school? Do we send our kids to school because we want them to gain knowledge? learn how to do math, learn how to read and write, learn how to pass down cultures. Is that part of education? Teaching them what our culture is, whether it's a cultural heritage that's unique, like I was born in Japan, or whether it's your religion. 
another way to think about education is, it's to have the correct politically correct thoughts or correct behavior to be happy to vote the right way. What is it? Because we have two concepts about education going on now. One's that the parents think is happening, and the other one, I believe, is what the school is doing to our kids. Many of us remember our schools. We may have fond memories of a teacher we had. I remember Mrs. Jones. She was the best teacher I ever had. And I am so happy now that my daughter gets Mrs. Jones. And so some of us who love and want to love our public schools remember our memories. But I want you to think that today it's not the same. In the past, we had schools where the teacher stood in the front of the room and gave knowledge and information to the children. They were doing what is called direct teaching. It is, the word is pedagogy, methods of teaching. It's called direct teaching is when somebody is standing and imparting information. And I am direct teaching right now. As opposed to what I call government schools of today. So the public schools that you went to are not the same as the government schools of today. Today, there is no sage on the stage. What they call it is guide on the side. The role of the teacher is a facilitator to draw information out of the child because a child is born with a certain amount of knowledge and it is not the teacher's job to squash that knowledge. The teacher's job is to pull that knowledge gently out of the child's brain. The other thing that's happening is a lot of peer teaching so that the children can work with each other and learn collaboration, learn consensus building, learn how to get along. That is more important than learning knowledge. And if you don't believe me, we'll go on and hopefully you might start realizing some of this is true. I want to state the teachers are the front lines. There are wonderful, wonderful teachers out there. And when you find that good teacher, support that teacher because they're bucking the system. So this is nothing to do with saying that the teachers are bad. There are wonderful principals. There are wonderful schools. And there are even wonderful school districts, especially the smaller ones. And over here in Mason County, the farther you get away from King County, you are going to find those good schools and good teachers. And hopefully, from what I'm going to say today, you will understand the importance of supporting those good school boards and teachers. And that we can then bring back a community school. So we have, in teaching and math in Washington State, that when I say that things are changing, that there is teaching math in Washington State where there are dysfunctional math beliefs. And in the dysfunctional math beliefs, it says that the goal of math activity is to provide the correct answer. That is dysfunctional. That the nature of math is to recall and apply algorithmic procedures. That is dysfunctional and that everything is black and white with no allowance for gray area. That is dysfunctional. And I'm going to just take a quick check here because I, yep. I thought I had missed a slide here. That came pretty quickly in my presentation. Um, page up. So I'm just going to go back and if you this is the one that I was hoping we'd have. So we have major acts of Congress. When I was talking about this government school concept, I'm going to go back and say, before 1965, the federal government was not involved in states' schools. Then they created the, the department, um, the Elementary and Secondary Act. And that was when the federal government said, we're just going to help out states and their public school systems if they, if they want it. Then came the creation of the Department of Education in 1979. After that, one of the major changes was something called Goals 2000. And under Goals 2000, that was when the, the beginning of something called the standards-based system, otherwise known as the performance-based system. 
It was a drastic change in how we delivered education. Because before, it used to be something called scope and sequence. It was expectations of a certain amount of facts and knowledge to be given and mastered at each grade level. In first grade, you would know the difference between letters and numbers and know your addition and subtraction. In second grade, you mastered the addition and subtraction and you went on to learning a little bit about multiplication, simple multiplication, some other things, coins, fractions, like one half and one fourth. And then by the time you get to fourth grade, you have to master multiplication, and that's when you do your times tables. And then in fifth and sixth grade, you're mastering division and fractions, like long division. So that by the time you hit junior high, you are doing algebra one, and then you can hit high school, and you're ready for geometry. And then by the time you're a junior in high school, you've had some higher level math, you're into calculus, and then by the time you're a junior or senior, you can do physics and you can do chemistry. Because all of that is a progression. Now we have this new system called standards-based education in which we thought and we were told that the standards were the sequence of knowledge. But it's not. That was where a bait and switch happened. So standards-based education came in and one of the things the federal government said is that every state, 50 states, had to create their own set of standards so that it would be unique to their state, to the needs of their state. And then they went around helping and giving money for every state to develop their own standards. In doing the standards, every state said, I don't know what this is, how do I do this? So it was recommended to go to certain think tanks to help them develop the standards. And so when this was going on, I actually pulled some standards in Colorado, in Vermont, in California, in Washington State, and I saw the same 10 words in different orders. So it told me that even though they're creating their own set of standards, there is a uniqueness about these standards. And that's what was going on. Then, in 2001, they came out with this new rule that says we're going to have a test for the standards. But notice they don't use the word test. They use the word assessment. So now every state must have an assessment to match their state standards. In Washington State, it was called the Washington Assessment of Student Learning, the WASO. So we developed the WASO. And that became, that was to test, I'm sorry, to assess our standards. Again, bait and switch. A test is the terminology used because there's a certain amount of information that you need to master. We take a driver's license test. We take a food handler's permit test because there's a certain amount of knowledge we're supposed to know and then we're supposed to master it. An assessment it's a subjective evaluation of the child's, the child's development, the ch child's process of thinking. It is not to see if the child has mastered a certain set of knowledge. That is what the assessment is. And in the Washington State, with the Washington Assessment of Student Learning, it was highly subjective. I also read the grading parameters. And the grading parameters said things like, you don't have to know how to spell as long as it's readable. You don't have to know how to write. You don't have to know how to put sentences or grammar together as long as you can get your message across. You don't have to have the correct answer in math as long as you know how to explain yourself. Okay. So that's the difference between an assessment and a test. But now we have a new system of assessments to measure everything. And so we have 50 states with 50 different standards, 50 different assessment systems, all funded by the federal government. And then in 2010, that same federal government came to all 50 states and said, oh my goodness, we have 50 different states and 50 different standards. We need to unite to one and let's call it Common Core. And that's how we got our Common Core system. Because it was, we had already destroyed the knowledge, we had destroyed testing systems that master knowledge, 
And now we're coming back with this thing called Common Core. And the Common Core test, which is either the PARC or Smarter Balance Assessment. And I have some examples of Smarter Balance. Then coming along a little bit later, we have what is now known as the American Rescue Plan. Again, the America Rescue Plan and all the other federal government policies have strings attached. And this is how they are controlling our state's standards, our state superintendents, and it's trickling down to our schools because of something called money. And so with Common Core, they said, if you just signed this letter and said, I will think about doing Common Core, you'll get $100 per student. Well, that kind of put them on the track. There is one school district that did not do it, that I know of, possibly two. They did not sign the agreements, they did not take Common Core money, and they are doing just fine. They did not lose any state funding, they did not lose any other federal funding. They just didn't get the Common Core money. But because they didn't get the Common Core money, they didn't have to buy new textbooks, they didn't have to train the teachers, they probably saved more money in the long run than having much to do. Ultimately, school boards have the right to make those decisions. Somebody asked, how much power do the school boards have? A lot. Before 1993, we had a law called the Education Law, and it said things like, you will learn how to interpret and make use of words and numbers. You, know, you will basically do reading, writing, and math. And in 1993, in House Bill 1209, Everything changed, and the new definition of education became to become responsible citizens, to contribute to the well economic and well-being of that to them and their families and communities, and to enjoy productive and satisfying lives. That was a definition of basic education. Today, that definition of basic education is to become an evolving program of instruction that is intended to provide students with the opportunity to become responsible and respectful global citizens and to enjoy productive and satisfying lives. Okay, I'm an accountant. If I am asked to do a cost-benefit analysis on a program that is evolving, how do I know when we've reached our goal? The McCleary decision is a blank paycheck for an evolving program of education. Let's kind of close up our pocketbooks now because it's, there is no end to it. If we're paying for books, if we're paying for something specific, there can be an end to it, but not this definition of education. Plus, it is said to become respectful global citizens, so to not teach United Nations is actually against Washington state law because we have to teach to global citizens. And the final words, productive and satisfying lives. You keep hearing the words college and career readiness. The reason why you hear college and career readiness is that everybody must be working or going to school. So the stay-at-home mom is not in this picture. A child who's disabled and cannot work has no value in this picture because they are not productive, although they might be living satisfying lives. And this is where I say our definition of education is you must be working and you must be happy. Because how else are you gonna be satisfied? Doesn't that imply happiness? So part of the shift that happened was when the National Governors Conference, all the governors coming together in 1989 and they had a speaker that said, what is happening in America today is a total transformation of our society. We have moved into a new era. Curriculum is not simply putting facts in kids' minds and it isn't teaching the past history of the world. We no longer see the teaching of facts and information as the primary outcome of education. The earlier we can intervene in the lives of people, the more effective we can be. That's called early learning. The purpose of education in schools is to challenge and change the thoughts, feelings, and actions of children. And good teaching is defined as challenging the student's fixed beliefs. 
Fixed beliefs are what we as parents teach our children when we send them to school. And now we have this statement where they are vowing to destroy those fixed beliefs in our children. The lady who said this, Dr. Shirley McCune, was in charge of the Mid-Continental Regional Educational Laboratory, um, which was in Kansas. She is the mother of, part of the, the reason why we have Title IX, she's considered sometimes the mother of Title IX, very powerful in the education world in Washington, D.C. And she was hired in the 1990s to come to Washington State and be part of the designer of Washington State's Wassel system. When she came to Washington State, she brought her ideas with her. She wrote books, and this one here is from where she wrote a forward to a book, Dr. Shirley McCune. She's director of the Lynx Project for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. And she says, science is a spiritual quest. Whether metaphysical or mathematical, the search is for meaning in our universe. So she has a slightly different philosophy about her. And if you notice, she also wrote a book called The Light Shall Set You Free which is another book that's going to reveal a lot about her way of thinking, her worldview. And I'm going to go in front of the projector again. And she brought that into Washington State, which is why we have the strange math we have. This is Common Core math. You'll see a lot about Common Core math is what we call um, regrouping, or they call it decomposing and recomposing numbers. You are not allowed to think of the 20 as just 20 plus 9. 29 is 20 plus 9. It could be 10 plus 10 plus 9. You're supposed to regroup your numbers, break it down, decompose it, and recompose it. This is an example of mathematics in, uh, from Tri-Cities. It's the pie chart. And the kids are supposed to line up the pie chart. And it says that Australia is the biggest part of the pie chart at 30%. So the mom said, no, that's wrong. Australia is not a large continent. And the child fixed it, went to school, came home and said, mom, you're wrong. This is the way it has to be for the correct answer. So the mom went to school, talked to the teacher, and the teacher said, this is a lesson in seeing if you can match up the colors for the pie chart. It is not a lesson in land mass. Therefore, all the children learned that Australia is the largest continent in the world. <laughs> this is another example of a math book. This was in 70% of Washington State schools. I don't know if any of you can recognize connected math. This is uh, sixth grade. I believe it was in this area as well. And that math problem in the updated color version, but it says, you will, um, this, oh gosh, it, that you have to find your special number. There it is. In your journal, record your number, and every math student has a journal. Explain why you chose that number. There's three or four mathematical things about the number. There's three or four connections you can make between that number and your world. If you can answer those questions, you get an A for your lesson plan in the connected math. Another connected math book. This one here I call Math Books with No Numbers. Other than page numbers, did you see any calculations in this geometry book? So the concept of proofs is not going to be taught in geometry in public schools anymore. And they aren't. So what does a test look like? We talked about smarter balance. This is a common core test. I got this off of their website. Liam is making lemonade. He needs 10 ounce, 16 ounces of lemon juice. He has 10 lemons. Each lemon makes about one and a half ounces of lemon juice. Will he have enough lemon juice, enough to make lemon juice? Explain how you know. Any, anybody want to guess an answer to this? So does he have enough lemons? 
No? Uh, what, was your answer no? No, okay. Well, the answer to this question is yes, and the answer is no, depending on how you explain yourself. If you assume he has giant lemons, he has enough. If you assume he's got a super duper lemon crusher, he has enough. So there is no concept of an absolute correct answer. And this is the SBAC test. And you may be thinking, oh gee, the teachers, they're not gonna get away with this, they're not gonna let you get away with this. Except this is the Washington State Professional Development Action Manual. And in it, although you can't read it, it says, if students know how their ability to construct understanding is, and think reflectively about a problem is more valuable than the correct answer, that is a great teacher. So a bad teacher is one where students believe there are right or wrong answers to questions and work uh, and determine what those are. Students come up with immediate responses and move on to the next question. Okay. If a teacher teaches that way, that is a bad teacher. And what we are dealing with is some, a philosophy called constructivism. Constructivism is where you allow the students to construct their own way of doing things. And this is, I don't know if you heard the word Chicago math, Chicago math, everyday math books. So this is the Chicago math teacher's guide. And it says, what exactly is algorithm, in, algorithm invention? Algorithm invention means that your child creates and shares her own problem solving methods instead of simply learning a set of prescribed standard algorithms. Okay. So every math book and even up to today, especially with the online math, whether you're doing iReady math, illustrated math, some of the other math, because um, there's not a lot of books anymore. People, schools are going to um, online math. You're gonna see a lot of constructivism. There's not a lot of deep thinking there's not a lot of computation skills. What I see is a lot of things that I would have called games. I would buy program, math programs for my kids when they were little, and I call it their math games, but it was not a math lesson. So I got to thinking about this, and I thought, if math teaches the discipline of applying logic to facts to result in one answer, what if you took things away? Discipline is also perseverance. What if you took away discipline because when you didn't do your math problems, your mom made you stay in, not, not watch TV, not go out to play, your teacher made you stay in from recess, and you had to try to do those problems over and over again until you got it right. And we hated it, and we may never have been good at math, but we tried. And in that trying, in that process of repetition, you develop something called perseverance, dedication, stick to itness. In today's world, two plus two is five, and I've got a great explanation to it. I'm done. How are you going to learn discipline of the mind when that is your whole world of math education from the school system? We have logical thinking skills, meaning that you have to have a correct answer. If this, then that. You follow a sequence of events and you come to an answer. What happens if you don't have that? What happens if you're playing your video game and you die and you respawn, you just hit the button and you're alive again? And you could do that a few more times before you lose points or do a start over. But you don't have a concept of finality. And so you don't have a concept of if this happens, then this happens. And so you don't have something called, called um, consequences. You don't understand the concept of consequences because you have to have that if-then ability to understand consequences. Base it on facts, and then you have the absolute right or wrong answer. 
So we already talked about truth and lies. But what happens if you don't understand that there's a line here, and this is truth, this is false, this is the correct answer, that's the incorrect answer, because there is no line in your life. Then you don't know when you're doing something wrong, and you don't understand how close you are to falling off the edge. And so that's why I say simple th efforts of teaching math to the correct answer can alter a child's character and way of thinking. When you don't have things like discipline and consequences, you also don't have something called commitment. We talked a lot about marriages falling apart, but you don't have commitment. If you don't understand these concepts, you don't understand why we need to stay together. There's other things that are happening in the classroom. We talked about number two, and we talked about number three, absolutes and linear thinking. But number one is another one. It's called, I call it authority to a higher power. It's also differences. The authority to power means that there are teachers and there are students. There is something called parents and children, employers and employees. And even though we may not like our boss, even though we think we know more than our boss, and we probably do, doesn't mean that we can disrespect the boss just because of the position they're in. And so now we have things like parents wanting to be their child's friend. Many of us may also have that fault, whether we realized it or not, that we allow other children, even teenagers, call us by our first name. When I grew up, I was never allowed to call my mom's friends by their first name. Even if I was 20 years old, they were Mr. and Mrs. to me. And my parents also remembered that when they were talking to me, they might say, Mrs. Jones is coming over. And then they turn around and talk to my dad and say, hey, Louise is coming over. Okay. They knew how to flip it. It was just automatic, but we don't do that. Everybody's on the first name basis. We have student-led teacher conferences. We want students on the school board. We want students on the city council. I hope they don't have voting rights as the elected officials, but that's what's going on. The final one, individuality. So with the advent of sex ed, with the advent of critical race theory, we are losing our individuality. We are losing our concept of our own identity because we have a school system that is trying to challenge our beliefs. Gee, I thought I was a girl. Now my teacher's telling me I should be a boy. And so I'm hearing also stories, especially of special needs children. Special needs children are not real social. They may not even dress with glitter and dress like a girl. They may be plain closed. And what I'm hearing is that there are some school systems that are attempting to force girls to become boys. And I'm hearing stories of parents that are talking to teachers, and one teacher said, oh, which child is yours? And she said, oh, that, that girl over there is my child. Oh, the one that's transitioning. Parent didn't know anything that their child was being transitioned by the school, and that the girl had a boy's name that was being used for two years. Okay. All of this, the parent didn't know about it. So in this thing that I call rewiring of the brain, I believe we are beginning to develop two different kinds of personalities. One is what I call the rock thinker. I believe everyone in this room is a rock thinker. We believe in facts. We believe in absolutes. We have solid judgment. We are anchored to truth, as opposed to the lava lamp thinker. The lava lamp thinker is this warm glob, and your glob is your truth. And you could hit the wall and break off and join another glob, and that becomes your new truth. You are not anchored in reality. You're not anchored in facts. So, for example, when I go to, oh, I, should, I know this has been recorded. When I go to Olympia, and I won't name the legislators, but I have to assess, am I talking to a rock thinker legislature or a lava lamp thinker? And I actually change how I approach them accordingly. The rock thinker, I could bring in my facts. 
I could bring in sheets of paper. The lava lamp thinker, I have to get creative and I have to use emotion. Or the other one is you have to get more guys on your side than they have on theirs. You have to have a bigger glob than they do. And that's what happened around 2005, is that when we saw these terrible math books with no numbers in it, a group of parents got together and formed a group called Where's the Math? They started working with different legislators around the state, and the perception was we had more guys on our side than they had on theirs, and we forced our legislator around 2006 and 7 to change the state law and rewrite our math standards. And these books were then not acceptable anymore based upon the new math standards. And I always remember that because it was a group of parents that forced our legislators to make that change, and we had some of the top-notch math standards in the nation in 2008. In 2010, Common Core came and we lost it all again. But we did it once, we can do it again. We have an enemy that wants to remove absolutes, break relationships, destroy our identity, our self-worth, our gender. We have a thought police going on. And it's all in here. We're not seeing that battle with guns, with ammunition, although there is Antifa at times. But for most of all, in most every city, every location, no matter how big or small your school district is, you are facing this battle in your school district because of that government. In the beginning, we talked about how government, government money, government policies are trickling down to the local school boards. And if the school boards do not understand how much power they do have to stand in, uh, in the, to stop it, and if you ever read RCW 28A 150.230, that spells out the responsibilities of a school board. But there are also some school boards that at the very beginning of the school year, early on, they adopt a policy that is called policy governance. Policy governance means that they are not allowed to work into the details of what's in the classroom. They kind of stand overall and, and conduct policy issues for the district as a whole, not for the classrooms. If a school district adopts policy governments, what they've just done I'm school board, if a school board votes for this, what they have done is allowed the superintendent to do all that micromanagement of the detail of what the textbooks are, what the standards are, all of that. So I do have, on the My Family, My Choice, workshops and classes to teach school board members running for office to be aware of policy governance and make sure how to identify it and not get sucked into it so that you keep your powers at the school board level and don't give it up. So all of that things, remember we change the standards, we're changing the identity of the children. The standards now have removed absolutes, they've removed truth, and now with social and emotional learning, they're coming in with lesson plans like this. Um, if your school district has this logo, welcoming schools, beware. They are teaching kindergartens and first graders that there is a difference between your sex assigned at birth and a difference between your sexual orientation and your gender identity. And there, this is a kindergarten first grade lesson. No, they're not teaching sex ed to our kids. They're only teaching social emotional learning, but social emotional learning is about identity and body awareness. So social and emotional learning is creating a new belief system in your child. In the beginning, because there is no out real law that has social emotional learning, there were several times over the years, I think 2009, um, there's about three times where there was a social emotional learning bill and um, my friends and I would go in and testify against it and we have stopped it every time. The only thing that we do have is a social emotional learning work group that can help advise the schools. But there is no social emotional learning law except 
and the sex ed bill from kindergarten to third grade. They are now mandated social emotional learning. That was one of the dangerous part of the laws, I thought. So we're, we're transforming how our ch children are. Um, I hope there's no little ones. I won't read the words because I saw some kids in the audience, but this is fourth grade bingo game where these are your vocabulary words and it is suggested that you might have to Google the word to find out what it means if you do not know. I see cringes, yeah. And then now, the advent of this thing called equity. These, the book over there is from Bellingham School District. Black Lives Matter started to write curriculum to put into the books and thank goodness many parents started attending school board meetings and put a stop to it. So I don't see Black Lives Matters books coming in. I think that those could be stopped easily. They're so controversial. However, the biggest problem is things like this book here, any book by Ibram Kendi. So what's going on is there is no mandate, there is no curriculum. If you go to your school and say, um, I don't want any equity, or you would call it critical race theory. The schools do not recognize that word. Critical race, CRT is culturally responsive teaching. So it is not an education word. Um, it is uh, outside of the education system, but they will recognize the word equity. So when you say, what are you teaching for equity? Then um, they will say there is no curriculum. What they do is they have a lot of recommended reading lists. So that's how you're gonna get it seeping in. It'll be outside reading lists. It'll be extra suggested, not curriculum, but fun materials for your kids to do, taken from websites that focus on equity. Um, it's a big push. Um, most people don't realize that there are six equity bills. The ones that are, that are most popular that people know about is 5044 which was to mandate that you are teaching equity for every adult, you know, teachers, um, everyone in the supervisors, administrators, school board members, they have to get like equity training. Kind of like everyone used to have harassment training classes if you work for a job. That's, I think it's gonna be coming in like that. But it's not onto the kids yet. They have equity in community colleges and Votech schools the equity in state colleges and universities, equity in medical schools, and the two other ones that I think are more dangerous but not talked about very often. House Bill 1426, mandating equity training if you want your teacher certificate. But by embedding it into professional development and teachers, there is a part of every teacher that in order to get your certificate, you have to prove that you've taught the lesson correctly. Hence, the children in your classroom become the guinea pigs. So this is one way equity can get into the classroom and affect your child, is when the teachers are going for their certification. Also, there are many private school teachers that are getting state certification. Now they are subjected to this equity clause if they are going through the Washington State Public School System. The last equity bill is the one on daycares. Dismantling systemic racism from birth to four-year-olds. And when we testified, one of my friends said, toddlers aren't racist. And so we were trying to put a stop to this, but unfortunately we could not. And so now we have a law which is similar to the equity laws for teachers, where every daycare provider must institute anti-racism policies in every one of their daycares. Hence, we have the anti-racist baby. That book was found in a Catholic daycare because under Department of Children and Youth and Services, daycares, there is no such difference between private and public daycares, religious and non-religious daycares. So now every daycare provider, in order to maintain their license, has got to comply with these anti-racist laws. That's the one I think is the most dangerous. We have something called truth, and we need to keep track of that. So when we look at our decisions and make our decisions, don't look at what other people are telling you. Say, what is really the right thing to do? Start there. 
Don't be a lava lamp. Be a rock thinker. Finally, why do I keep doing this? Why does everyone, you know, are they becoming engaged? It's for the future. The philosophy of the classroom today is the philosophy of the government tomorrow. And we have to return our nation back to the God that created it and gave us America. And side note, that little girl there, she's one quarter Japanese. How can you say that we live in this anti-racist world and you're looking, judging people by skin color when you really don't even know what the mix of families are? Her father's cousin is black and another one is Hispanic. And that's my granddaughter. So, thank you. Hey, Sharon. Well, I guess now it's questions. I, you know, we got to be. I want to be sensitive to time. You have covered such incredible information for us tonight, and uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows how to get a hold of you because I, ho I hope you guys all absorb this. Right? We had a couple of kids in the group tonight. Are any kids still here? With your parents' permission, would you guys come on up? Because I want to. I want to thank Sharon. She. Not only are you a uh, family-friendly honey badger, an incredible research mom, you're going to represent all the kids tonight? Uh, sure. All right. What's your name? <laughs> uh, Benjamin. Come on over here. But I want to thank you, Sharon. You, you rock. You are a rock, and we know you stand on a rock, right? Well, I'm not a lava lamp. <laughs> I try not to be the lava lamp. And um, she's right. We're at war. We're at war for, for all the kids who were here and who aren't here, your grandkids and your great-grandkids, right? And the enemy is playing for keeps. It's a war for their minds, it's a war for their hearts, and it's a war to enslave them. It's not a war we started, it's not a war we asked for, but we will win. We're not gonna let this succeed, right? And it's up to every one of us in this room teaming up with great people like Sharon to make this stuff stop, right? Because this is what's at stake. So Sharon, once again, thank you. Let's all give it up for Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for and, being our poster child yeah. today. Appreciate that. Bring me back for part two and I'll tell you what you can do. I guess I ran out of time. <laughs> thank you. Okay. We have some, we, we'll wrap this up formally with a, a closing prayer from Phil Wilson, and then I'm gonna announce the winners of the uh, silent auction back there. So, and then we'll, we'll close it up for tonight. But as, um, so Phil, come on up. I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the closing prayer. Take it away. All right, wasn't that good? Let's bow our heads. Oh, Lord God, we do just thank you. Thank you for those who came and spoke tonight, for Mark uh, and uh, for Sharon. Lord, we are grateful for the things that they've been able to help us understand. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that you would just help to uh, stir our spirits to be able to um, stand up against evil where that's coming out. And help us to know how to do that in a way that expresses your love, your love for those who even don't know you or uh, don't love you. We want to be a light in this community, and we're just grateful for those who are able to come tonight. Thank you for each one that came. Just inspire them uh, in the things that they're doing, that um, they would stand for righteousness, that this community would stand for righteousness, despite what other communities do. We just ask for that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you, Phil. All right. You guys, you guys are not as competitive as you look. So the moment you've all been waiting for, here's our silent auction winners for tonight. So the winner for just winging it and more at the Boathouse Sisters restaurant and the railroad tap station goes to Evelyn Huff. That's you. Enjoy. A uh, little bubbly, courtesy of Hoodsport Winery, goes to Dale Witte. I, I'm going to butcher everybody's name. Congratulations, Dale. Come on up. 
And uh, the beautiful flower uh, bouquet back there <laughs> from LNC Construction and House of Birdie goes to some guy, Steve Dunkel, I never heard of him before. <laughs> Just an ordinary guy. And then we have uh, work and play uh, pr provided by Ace Hardware and Verl Sports Center and Marine, and that goes to Greg Jenny. Woohoo! Woo Congratulations, Greg. And the dinner out in Mason County, not at my house, but at El Sarape Mexican restaurant and Smoking Moe's goes to Bernie Walton. Way to go, Bernie. Congratulations. Okay, Brew and Eats, um, provided by Radio Flyer in Morocco Coffee, goes to Carol Davis. Where's Carol? There she is, way to go. Congratulations, Carol. The cameo, wait, the spoil, the one you love, this, I think this one got scratched out. Yeah. I guess nobody loves anybody here. Okay. Um, the railroad, oh, here we go, indulge, uh, again, courtesy of railroad tap station and hallelujah fudge, this has got to be powerful, goes to Melissa Wilson, did I get the name right? Melissa, way to go, congratulations. And here we go again, uh, let's see, I can't believe you guys let this one get away. Alderbrook Golf and Yacht Club, tea time for round of golf for four. Man, I snagged that one. I beat you to it. <laughs> okay, those are our winners for tonight. Hey, listen, you guys have been great. I want to just give a special thanks to uh, Cynthia Radke for pulling this together and the sponsors, uh, conservative-oriented families and citizens of Mason County. You guys know what we have to do, right? We have to protect our kids. We have to, take, we have to hold on to the things that are important to us and we will. So thank you once again. Appreciate it. Have a nice evening.